Have you ever felt lonely and forlorn? Have you ever raised your eyes to the night sky, that black and different ocean, and thought that you might as well be invisible? Well, it may be of some comfort to know that up there in that very indifferent sky, at any time, there are seven buddies who are constantly circling around the Earth, eating snacks from magnetized trays, and taking very complicated toilet breaks. Occasionally, they might even launch into a David Bowie song. More importantly, those orbiting men and women keep a keen eye on our planet, taking millions of photos and collecting tons of data via their scientific payloads. Even more importantly, they conduct hundreds of experiments to the benefit of space exploration, medicine, agronomy, climatology, and other scientific fields. We're talking about the International Space Station or the ISS, a staple of scientific advancement and cross-cultural friendship, once described as a fantastic example of high-profile international cooperation, or even the greatest international cooperative project ever undertaken. The ISS, however, has been around for a long time. Like the mythical ship of Theseus, it's been patched up and upgraded countless times over the decades, and it is starting to show its age. That's why NASA has recently announced that by 2031, the International Space Station will be no more. But is this a sound decision? How will they decommission it, and who and what will carry the torch of constant human presence in Earth's orbit? Before we get into the future of the ISS, let's take a look at its past history. The US government considered placing a permanent station in low Earth orbit as early as the 1950s. An early design developed by the Army involved an orbital refueling station to supply spacecraft on their way to a permanent moon base. It was the era of the space race, so the Soviet Union had similar plans, but both superpowers had to contend with the bane of scientific development, budget restrictions. Assembling and then launching such a structure into orbit would have been just too expensive. But in 1984, President Ronald Reagan found some spare change under the couch and authorized NASA to begin work on an orbiting station. NASA Administrator James Beggs knew that the US, however rich and powerful, could not do it alone, and thus he set out to enroll a number of other international partners. The CSA, or Canadian Space Agency, the ESA, European Space Agency, and JAXA, their Japanese counterpart. In 1993, when the Soviet Union was well and truly collapsed, Beggs invited also Roscosmos, the Russian space agency. This team of international super friends worked feverishly on designing and constructing the components of the ISS. Finally, in 1998, the individual units took to space for assembly. Now, this didn't happen all at once, of course, and the ISS was finally completed only in 2011. It had taken a total of 42 assembly flights, 37 of which were conducted by US space shuttles and five by Russia's Proton rockets. Since then, the coalition of five partners has managed the station, sending joint expeditions to the craft. Expedition 1 first docked on November 2, 2000, when the ISS comprised a mere three modules. Since then, it has been continuously inhabited with a total of 279 astronauts, cosmonauts, and scientists from 22 different countries, taking turns in groups of up to seven participants. As of August 2024, the crew of Expedition 71 is gently floating about in the station's environment, waiting for Expedition 72 to take over in September. Now, when it comes to day to day management, each participating agency takes care of their own tech and hardware where but they all share a common set of objectives. Initially, the ISS had been conceived as an outpost for human space exploration, but gradually became more of a microgravity laboratory dedicated to experimentation in a variety of fields – human physiology, radiation, material science, engineering, biology, fluid physics, and technology – all of which have applications in space and also on Earth. And besides the tangible impact of these experiments, the agencies in charge recognize the inspirational value of the ISS. In NASA's words, leveraging the ISS as an education platform to encourage and motivate today's youth to pursue careers in math, science, engineering, and technology, educating the children of today to be the leaders and space explorers of tomorrow. As of August 2024, the ISS is placed at an orbital altitude between 370 and 460 kilometers, constantly circling the Earth on a path which covers 90% of the planet's population. It's 109 meters long, that's almost exactly one American football field, and has a mass just shy of 420,000 kilograms, which is equivalent to some hundred hippos stacked on top of each other. The crews can find basic yet adequate accommodation on the ISS, including sleeping quarters, two bathrooms, a 360-degree view bay window, and even a gym. The latter, not a luxury, but rather a necessity. Humans tend to lose muscle and bone mass in microgravity, and thus the residents of the station must work out at least two hours every single day. By the time an astronaut completes their workout, the ISS has completed more than 
one full orbit of the Earth. As the station travels at a speed of 8 kilometers per second, it takes about 90 minutes to circle the planet. While not pumping iron, ISS crews carry out maintenance tasks, take spacewalks, and make good use of the microgravity laboratory. This lab can boast almost 3,000 research investigations conducted by the crews on behalf of scientific institutions across 108 countries. And that's the key point. The use of the laboratory is not limited to the US, Canada, Japan, Russia, and the 22 member states of the ESA. Other countries' institutions can benefit from its research facilities. Human presence in low Earth orbit does not come cheap, as you might imagine. So what was the price tag for constructing, transporting, assembling, and maintaining the ISS? As of 2001, just when its operations had started, the US General Accounting Office placed its total cost at about $95 billion. That's almost $169 billion adjusted for inflation. 79% of that bill was taken by design and construction, with the rest described to transport into orbit. But those are just the setup costs. An additional $1.3 billion are required every year to keep the space station operational. The ESA provides a similar estimate, a total of 100 billion euros for the 1998 to 2008 period. Of these, the ESA's contribution was only 8 billion euros. In their words, the European share at around 8 billion euros spread over the whole program amounts to just one euro spent by every European every year, less than the price of a cup of coffee in most of our big cities. All while generating high-tech jobs in European industry and research institutions, contributing to the build-up of Europe as a peaceful knowledge and information society, and to the greatest international cooperation project ever undertaken. Not everybody may agree with the ESA's positive outlook, though even Nobel laureates have questioned if the benefits of having a low-orbit station justified the cost. So was it, and is it, worth it? Well, yes, apparently. According to Professor Ian Crawford of Burbeck University of London, a planetary science expert, quoting him here, the ISS is a fantastic example of high-profile international cooperation at a time when the world desperately needs examples of activities that can bring people and nations together. Professor Charles Cockle at Edinburgh University agrees, quoting him, running the International Space Station has shown us that human beings can make their homes away from their own planet in outer space. It was a hell of an effort to get everyone to agree to the station and then to build it, so we need to encourage companies to keep the station going for at least another decade. Besides such inspirational benefits, the ISS and its microgravity laboratory can boast a number of wins, often not directly related to space explorations, such as in the field of medical diagnostic devices. Small ultrasound scanning units developed for the station's crew have been made available to us Earthlings by WinFocus, the world interactive network focused on critical ultrasounds. The ISS technology has been made available to 45,000 physicians operating in remote areas across 60 countries where more conventional ultrasound devices are not available. Again, in the medical field, private partner LAM Division is experimenting on how to leverage microgravity to develop highly advanced artificial retinas for human transplant. And an ISS study of a protein associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy has propelled promising Japanese research on a potential treatment for the disease. Shortly after that study, in 2016, astronaut Kate Rubens completed the first successful DNA sequencing in space, an achievement with huge potential. Not only will it allow us to identify pathogens on future space missions, but may help identify life in the solar system. And one last example takes us outside the confines of the lab. NASA's EcoStress, a payload designed to measure subtle changes in temperature. Data generated by EcoStress has been used to monitor and manage excessive heat in large cities, reduce the risk of forest fires, track the population of mosquitoes, and optimize the allocation of water to farms and urban centers. These are just a few examples of advances facilitated by the ISS, in addition to the expected contribution to human space exploration. Nonetheless, the station has its critics. British astrophysicist Sir Martin Rees put it very bluntly. There is no way you could justify the vast sums that have been spent on building the ISS. The scientific returns have been meager. Really, the station only makes news when its toilets get blocked or an astronaut sings while floating about with a guitar. Nobel laureate Steve Weinberg at the University of Texas, Austin, is more specific. The only interesting science done on the ISS has been the study of cosmic rays by the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. But astronauts played no role in its operation. It could have been placed in orbit much more cheaply by an unmanned mission. Professor Weinberg further elaborates that the ISS was only able to produce technology aimed at keeping humans alive in space, which in his view is a, quote, senseless and circular process if you realize there is no point in having humans in space. These evaluations are a matter of opinion. But there is one undeniable fact acknowledged by NASA and its international partners. The ISS is quickly becoming obsolete, which is only natural considering that since its design phase, the ISS was not intended to last forever. And in fact, according to NASA, its original intended lifespan had already been extended several times by replacing and upgrading its modules and payloads, quoting them. Much of the station is modular, and so as parts and systems wear out, new parts are launched to replace or augment the original. 
but there is only so much you can upgrade an old craft before it starts creaking. The ISS lately has been suffering from air leaks, thruster failures, and other faults caused by its constant orbiting at great speed, exposure to heat from the sun, and spacecraft dockings. As the major founder of ISS, NASA had to seriously consider some options regarding the future of the station. Would it be possible to keep it as it is, with a few touches of DIY here and there? According to Phil McAllister, director of the Commercial Space Division of NASA, this is not economically viable. Quoting him, I kind of see this like an automobile. When we bought that automobile in 1999, it was state-of-the-art, and it has been great. But it's getting older. It's getting harder to find spare parts. The maintenance for that is becoming a larger issue. Robin Gatons, director of the International Space Station, provides more details. According to him, the technology aboard the craft is still top-notch and could be upgraded. But what cannot be upgraded and repaired forever is the structure itself of the ISS. Something that strikes the eye when looking at images of the ISS is how cluttered it looks. Its interior appears to be almost entirely covered in cables, screaming for an IKEA cable organizer to take care of the mess. Astronaut Peggy Whitson, the first woman to command the ISS, explained to NBR that the wiring nightmare is a result of structural obsolescence. Essence. Upon its construction, the station was not designed to accommodate its current vast array of lab equipment and payloads. Hence, engineers had to layer each new addition on top of the other, which begs the question for how long can the original structure withstand the onslaught of upgrades. Hence, NASA reached a hard-thought and heartfelt decision. The time had arrived to send the ISS into retirement. But how? Well, one of the options considered was to push up the station, placing it on a higher orbit where it would be vacated and mothballed. The snag here is the lack of maintenance. Left to its own devices, the ISS may experience hardware failure and potentially drift out of orbit, plummeting to Earth in an uncontrolled fall. That option would pose too many risks, so NASA considered the next option, dismantling the ISS piece by piece, module by module, and transporting it back to Earth. The price tag for such an operation would have been reasonable if the re-entry flights were conducted by Space Shuttle, but since the closure of the Space Shuttle program in 2011, and any other controlled re-entry option would just be too costly. The third and final option, eventually selected by NASA, is to simply send the ISS falling into the Pacific Ocean from its current orbit. Now, you might be thinking, <laughs> how sure are they of that? Wouldn't it be a bit risky to throw the equivalent of 100 hippos from an average height of 400 kilometers? I mean, the Pacific is massive, but uh, what if they hit Hawaii or something? Well, fear not, for NASA have prepared a plan for a controlled deorbiting operation. After the last crew is brought back to Earth, NASA will initially allow the ISS orbit to decay naturally for a period of 12 to 18 months. Next entering the picture is Elon Musk. Well, not Elon Musk personally, but his private space company, SpaceX. The company will provide NASA with a modified version of their Dragon spacecraft, larger than the original model and boasting a four-fold thrusting power. The craft will perform a series of propellant burns, further pushing down the orbit of the ISS and thus controlling its descent. A final burn will then initiate the final fall of the station, aiming towards the South Pacific. Intense air friction will then break down the station's modules, igniting them on fire. Most of the components will completely burn up before they hit the planet, while the larger and most durable units will safely impact on the ocean and sink beneath the waves. Plans for deorbiting have already been initiated. According to the roadmap, the modified Dragon craft will be ready by 2028, and the final destructive flight of the ISS will take place in 2031. So, will that be it then? Humankind will never live again, experiment, and discover up there in low Earth orbit. Will we be deprived of that constant, friendly presence watching us from above? Well, no. The ISS is not the only space station up there. China's Tiangong was first launched in April 2021 and has been manned since June 2022. Besides, NASA and its international partners will not just get rid of their old station. This will be replaced by a program involving not one, not two, but three space stations developed by the private sector. Quoting them, three NASA-funded commercial space station partners are on track for the design and development of their orbital destinations and the transition of the agency's low Earth orbit needs from the International Space Station. So, let's meet these contractors, shall we? We have already introduced one multi-billionaire with space ambitions, so let's now take a look at another one, Jeff Bezos. His commercial space company, Blue Origin, was awarded a NASA contract in 2021 to develop a station named Orbital Reef currently in development. Bezos is not alone in this endeavor, as his company has partnered with other firms, Redwire, Sierra Space, Genesis Engineering, and Boeing. Orbital Reef will carry out tasks similar to those of the ISS, sure, with NASA and other national space agencies as its main client. But it appears that Blue Origin and partners are seeking to differentiate their business model. According to the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, Orbital Reef is being designed, quote, for commercial space activities and space tourism uses. Blue Origin has referred to it as a mixed-use business park. 
Network. The IEEE suggests, however, that the cooperation between Blue Origin and other firms may not be, quote, on such strong ground. Such endeavors may also end up slowed and controlled by regulations so far absent from many new commercial areas of space. Regardless, it appears that initial tests for Orbital Reef's core module and 360-degree bay window went just fine and dandy. The IEEE also points out that Blue Origin may be able to deliver its space station on a fraction of the ISS budget. So, how much exactly? Well, we only we know that NASA's contract was worth $130 million, which is not likely to cover all design and construction costs. So we guess that explains the need for space tourists. The next firm in our roster is Voyager Space, also contracted by NASA in 2021. Their planned station will be called Starlab, developed in cooperation with partners Airbus, Northrop Grumman, Mitsubishi, MDA Space, Palantir, and Hilton. And yes, that's Hilton like Hilton Hotels. Apparently, they will be in charge of architecture and design for the living quarters, but it seems that at least for the moment, Voyager and friends are not considering space tourism. According to an official company statement, quote, Starlab will serve a global customer base of space agencies, researchers, and companies ensuring a continued human presence in low Earth orbit and a seamless transition of microgravity science and research from the International Space Station into the new commercial space station era. Thus far, NASA appears impressed by Starlab's progress as Voyager nailed two important milestones, initiating tests for an orbit-to-ground laser communication system and for a system to recover purified drinking water from urine. Finally, we have Axiom, partnering with Thales Alenia Space. Their work appears to be in a far more advanced stage compared to the other two contractors, and for good reason. You see, the plans for the Axiom station are significantly different, as the company is already working alongside NASA to develop four new modules or habitats to be docked to the ISS, designed to operate for up to 30 years. The first habitat, Axiom Hab 1, will be launched in 2026. The remaining modules will be transported to the ISS by a SpaceX rocket, and each will be able to support four astronauts. Residency in the habitats will be offered to both national space agencies and private companies, but tourism is again off the table. The focus will be on microgravity experimentation in the fields of crystals, fiber optics, and metallurgy. The four habitats will be docked to the ISS, thus forming a separate segment. At an unspecified time, but surely before 2030, the Axiom segment will be detached from the ISS, becoming the independent Axiom station. It seems that the future of the ISS has been sealed. The maths make sense. Maintaining the station oh, would cost billions, with the risk of failures or even worse accidents constantly looming over its obsolete structure. It's much more viable to award an initial contract to a private company and then let them put the bill. So, within seven years, inhabitants of the South Pacific Isles may notice a shower of bright falling stars in the night, the last vestiges of an epic endeavor of space exploration and friendship amongst nations. However rationally sound, NASA's decision does not sit well with everybody in the space exploration community, though. Fine, we have to get rid of it, we get it, but wouldn't it be possible to preserve it for cultural reasons? Well, two very vocal dissenters are Jean-Jacques Dordain and Michael Griffin. Dordain is a former director general of ESA, while Griffin was his counterpart at NASA. Both were in office when the ISS was being built and have appealed for the station to be protected, quote, as an unparalleled treasure house of technology, a beacon of human inventiveness that could be boosted above the the high traffic zone of low Earth orbit that it now flies through. They have pointed out that the SpaceX Dragon craft, instead of spelling the station's doom, could be used to propel it into a higher orbit. Their vision is similar to NASA's discarded mothballing plan, albeit they would like for the ISS to become a sort of monument or memorial to space exploration. Former NASA chief historian Roger Launius agreed with Dordain and Griffin, stating, The station should be elevated into a sanctuary orbit in recognition of its role as a heroic icon of the space age. 100 years hence, humans may well look back on the building of the station as the first truly international endeavor among peaceful nations.